morning, everyone. Welcome to the breakfast at the FOM. We are from the Department of Psychological Medicine. I am the Associate Prof. NE. Today, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce my colleague, Associate Prof. D, and he is going to talk about decriminalization. His topic is uh, criminalizations of drug use and toxic society. Decriminalization, the way for Many thanks to thank you for organizing this. Uh, sorry, I have to open my uh, my mask because I'm <laughs> breathless. It, it's okay because we are social distance. Yeah. Um, have you <coughs> take your breakfast already, Prof? N? Yes, I have. Okay. Yeah. So uh, thank you for inviting me again. Okay, so uh, my topic today, criminalization of drug use and society, decriminalization, the way forward. I think this is a very important topic because uh, at the moment we have a uh, you know, crowded set. So the, I mean, the, they are actually going to the prison. So, uh, okay, um, <clears throat> This overview of my presentation today. I would like to share uh, about the history of drug use and uh, addiction as a chronic vaccine brain disease, uh, talking about the criminalization of drug use and the emergence of the society, harm reduction and success story in Malaysia, uh, changing pattern of substance use in Malaysia, uh, decriminalization as solution and conclusion. Uh, as you know, that uh, uh, up until to 1960s, drug abuse in Asia is uh, mainly uh, involved uh, opium, because it's related to the Chinese uh, immigrant populations. But since 1980s, uh, the Malays have become the ethnic, major ethnic group that involved with addictions and occupy uh, the society centers in Malaysia. Uh, there is a concern about the rapid increase in having use, and the government actually. Um, Go into uh, a mission or vision, uh, have what we call drug free nation by the year 2000. But unfortunately, uh, the problem is uh, some ways getting worse. Um, and in Malaysia, uh, the info we have uh, more than 50 grams of heroin possessions, you can actually what we call uh, a mandatory death sentence. So, uh, don't play play in Asia. So, this, this uh, law stay applied. Okay, uh, this is quite important. I would like to highlight this because many of us uh, didn't understand what, what are the addiction is. So, addiction is a chronic brain disease, a medical illness. And it's actually a uh, combination of uh, multiple uh, etiology. You know, for example, so it's genetic. Causes, uh, physiologic causes, uh, pharmacological, uh, the direct effect of the drug itself is actually play an uh, important role in development of addiction and, of course, the environmental or social factors. And the uh, addiction is characterized by repeated use of substance or behavior despite clear evidence of uh, resulting from the first use. And those who actually uh, consume alcohol for chronic or uh, regular use, they lost control over the substance because of the uh, damage of the reward center. And this damage is irreversible. That is why uh, sometimes you ask the drug addict, they want to stop, but uh, they can't control and they keep going into relapse of uh, drug use. So this is uh, just a dra dra dramatic uh, uh, background, uh, just to say, uh, to highlight uh, multiple uh, factors uh, or etiologies about to in addiction illness. You can see here uh, biology, uh, biological uh, or genetics uh, play very important together with the environment. And the drug itself, uh, the direct effect of uh, positive uh, reinforcement leading to uh, changes in the brain mechanism, particularly uh, at the brain uh, reward center, brain and uh, addiction. 
is another diagram just to explain. Eh? The reward center which is situated, uh, situated in the uh, nucleus at Cumber, uh, is a uh, nucleus at Cumber and also central diameter area. That project to the pre pointer contact, as you can see, where the substance has a different, different side of uh, activation. Yeah. So, the concept of addiction has changed over the 18th, uh, 21st centuries. As you uh, know, that when we first uh, open up our such yeah, nationwide, we actually see the drug addiction as a uh, moral issues. Security is, a, is our main concern. Eh? And, and now it's actually moving towards a medical model. Uh, punitive also, uh, punitive approach in the past, and now we are, uh, we are moving to a rehabilitative approach. And as you uh, notice, eh, uh, to such 20 governments uh, apply what we call total abstinence philosophy. But now uh, slowly we are moving towards uh, harm reduction. Because we, with the agreement, uh, uh, addiction as a chronic medical, and of course, uh, in the past, uh, even here, we still uh, practice. We see drug addiction as a criminal. Those who actually admitted in the post uh, uh when they come out, uh, they been labeled as a uh, ex convict, and and now, of course, we are moving towards decriminalization in order. To Minimize stigma as well as to address the health issues. Uh, nowadays, uh, there is a changing pattern of substance use. Uh, in the past, we we used to uh, hear about these uh, traditional drugs, you know, example like heroin or cannabis. But now, this drug has has becoming less popular uh, due to avail availability of the methadone and also been as a treatment option. Uh, newer drug. Uh, especially among youngsters, uh, it's actually uh, now using a designer drug. For example, uh, what we, we also call uh, amphetamine type stimulants, you know, like methamphetamine, street name Shabu, MDMA or ecstasy, ketamine or vitamin K, and also Yabapil, or what we call Pil uh, Kuda, especially uh, in the Northern Peninsula Malaysia. And However, there was no pharmacotherapy uh, treatment available so far for these uh, dependent drugs, and we only rely on psychosocial interventions. Uh, criminalization of drug use and the emergence of toxic society. I think this is very important for me to highlight because, uh, I don't know, uh, we cannot just uh, blame the um, drug addicts why they become, you know, niche. To a petty crime and so on. Uh, it's actually, uh, you know, it's probably due to our uh, policy as well that made them become toxic society. Um, in Malaysia, there was a main uh, main drug law in Malaysia include uh, Dangerous Drug Act 1953, uh, Drug Rehabilitation Act 1983, and also Poison Act. Uh, so these uh, are the responsible. Uh, uh, law that actually uh, make our <laughs> our drug addict being accumulated in in the prison and also in the drug rehab centers, the the government's uh, uh, In Malaysia, if you get caught, yeah, you're in positive. You can actually be forced into the compulsory rehabilitation for two years, uh, even though you're not ha having any possession of drugs. And if you possess the drug, you may go into under Dangerous Drug Act 1952, which means that you can go into the prison as well. And of course, the Poison Act uh, also apply to, especially for new psychoactive uh, substance, for example, like uh, kratom or ketum. You, uh, if you if you consume ketum uh, by yourself, it's okay. But if you uh, uh, distribute or you sell it, you, know, you can actually uh, Poison Act 1952. And what the the main problem when people go into the prison or people go into the rehab because of their drug use or their drug possession or both, they have what we call this uh, increasing stigma. Uh, for example, post-serenity syndrome that I would like to highlight here. Uh, those who are released from the serenity, they are being labeled as an ex-criminal, ex-convict. Uh, they have a difficulty to get jobs and they have a rejection from the family and society. And because of that, you know, um, 
they can work, they have a disappointing employment, they, they have tendency to involve in crime in order to support their drug use. And this contributes to the high rate of uh, revolving door syndrome, or what we call recidivism, and of course, the overcrowding of the prison's population. So what are the complications? Eh? Other complications uh, related to substance use, uh, of course, uh, have complications, eh? rising blood bond disease uh, prevalence due to intravenous drug use, especially uh, when they inject and also they, they share the needles. So uh, HIV AIDS, eh? hepatitis B and C, uh, tuberculosis uh, is actually very prevalent among this group of people and uh, they are very, very potential to spread all the disease in the community, their spouse, their friends, their family, and so on. And of course, another uh, problem, especially with uh, ATS, amphetamine type stimulants, we have uh, the number of patients uh, being admitted almost every day in our work, uh, substance induced psychosis, particularly due to this uh, uh, ATS. Uh, and then uh, depression, uh, mania, and also suicide as a result of. Uh, uh, secondary depression developed because of the uh, rejection from the society, uh, chronic unemployment, and also the medical illness that they have. Uh, another uh, common uh, complication, rising overdose deaths and toxicity uh, prevalence among those people who are actually not only take the illicit substance, but of course for those who are actually been uh, buying methadone uh, at the black markets. And of course, uh, what is the most important for the country is the loss of uh, pro productivity. When they occupy serenity center or when they have been uh, uh, sentenced uh, into the prisons, uh, we lost uh, the product productivity uh, group, uh, which is uh, we know that ma majority of our drug addicts, they are actually uh, within the, the uh, productive age. So this uh, just to highlight, uh, uh, the infectious disease. I actually sharing this uh, slide uh, given by uh, Prof. Adiba, our, our, our deans. Uh, as you can see here, the mega epidemic of HIV, uh, if you compare between Malaysia, Vietnam, and other countries like China, you can see that uh, the, the proportions of uh, HIV uh, in Malaysia is uh, quite high, about uh, it's more than uh, uh, 80%. Uh, as you can see there, uh, uh, actually contributes uh, contracted HIV because of uh, needle sharing or intravenous drug use. Um, the study that we conducted by 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 uh, uh, Prof Hadiba and and the team also, as you can see here in the prisons, you the the prevalence of latent TB uh, is actually uh, much higher as compared to general population. Among the prisoners, it's about 98.8 percent. Uh, and those uh, uh, prisoners in Kajang eh, and, and, and Pekalan Cepa uh, is also high as well, about 87. And not only that, staff or warden in prison Kajang, as you can see, up to 81%. If you, if you see this, uh, you will be uh, feeling fearful to work in this uh, prison because you may also get contracted with the TB as well. Uh, just to strengthen uh, my, my point with regard to overcrowding of uh, Malaysian prisons, as you can see here, uh, data from year 2017, uh, prisons uh, population uh, relates to drug related offense. As you can see here, as high as 56%, and nearly 60%. And this actually um, overcrowd. Uh, official capacity of the prison, uh, this uh, referring to year 2016, is uh, supposed to be uh, 45 but uh, occupancy level is actually far more beyond the occupancy, uh, uh, far, far more beyond the, the capacity, as you can see here, up to 55,000. So this uh, really uh, become like incubator of infectious disease because the, the system in the prison does not really uh, look into uh, um, uh, the, the prevent, preventive measures how to, to, to spread. Uh, this disease is inside there. Uh, these are newspaper paper cut, cutting just to, to highlight uh, about the uh, overcrowding of the uh, prison in Malaysia. Uh, majority of, uh, we have 30, 30 prisons in Malaysia and majority of these prisons is actually overcrowding. 
and so it's a good uh, incubator for all the infectious diseases. That's how the, 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 the infectious disease spread in Malaysia. And this is just to highlight about jumlah tangkapan di bawah tadara berbahaya, ADB, 1952. As you, as you can see here, uh, from year 2013 to, to 2017, there is an increasing number of, uh, of uh, those uh, cases being, uh, being caught, uh, as you can see here. But of course, we, we cannot uh, just uh, uh, assume there is an increasing number, but it also depends on the amount of grant that, that the police actually uh, get. Uh, the the, the, in, the increase, increasing number of the of the operations they do, of course, uh, there will be probably an increasing number of the of the cases as well. Yeah. So, so far, we don't have uh, any uh, uh, good ep epidemiological study that been uh, carried out. Uh, I remember the National Health Community Survey in year 2015. We only have uh, um, data with regards to um, uh, 15, uh, 18 years and below. But uh, I hope uh, for the next uh, National Health Mobility Survey conducted by the Ministry of Health, we, we will have a proper, a proper uh, ep epidemiological study uh, in order to have a more reliable data with regard to number of dry IDs in Malaysia. Uh, <clears throat> so, I, what I can conclude that is failure of war on drugs in Malaysia. As you can see, uh, you know, those who are actually been admitted in the prison, when they come out, uh, they involve with crime, they relapse, uh, and they go back again uh, in the uh, prison setting. And this uh, rate of recidivism is actually uh, not really uh, changed uh, much. Uh, there is a dominance of law enforcement over health. Uh, as I mentioned just now, KPI for enforcement, which is uh, it's not the true pictures uh, to, 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 to see the progress of uh, addition treatment in Malaysia. Uh, there is lack of clarity and duplication of roles uh, between those agencies involved, uh, for example, like ADK prison. Uh, and also the police. Uh, moral and religious framework uh, uh, link, uh, link to the prohibitions, uh, like, for example, like this Perangi Dada Habi Abisan, and mainly focus on total abstinence approach instead of uh, uh, harm reductions. And of course, when, 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 when things have uh, been uh, prohibited, uh, the corruption uh, arise, uh, uh, not only in the community, but but even in the in the uh, prison as well as uh, help center as well. Um, this is just uh, to highlight uh, uh, our harm reduction programs that we uh, been carried out in Malaysia since year uh, 2005. As you can see, more than uh, 100,000 registered for needle syringe exchange program, and uh, about uh, 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 10,000 uh, involved or registered in. Uh, opioid substitution treatment or medication assisted treatment program. And we are not only have a methadone in the uh, community, uh, in the ADK as well as a prison, but we even have a, a methadone program in the mosque, which has been highlighted in the New York Times uh, around Okay, um, now, now we go to uh, definitions, uh, sorry, of uh, decriminalization. Uh, I think uh, the way forward is uh, decriminalization as a solution. So decriminalization, decriminalization is defined as a uh, refer to the policy that reduce the penalties for drug offense. Uh, typically, a uh, severe penalty for possession of small amount of drugs instead of a criminal prosecutions. And decriminalization is not the same as legalization, where both of the productions and say remain illegal uh, and subjected to the criminal justice system. So uh, this is very important for, for, for the public and even for professionals to understand that decriminalization is uh, not the same as legalization. And legalization, on the other hand, uh, lifted banning or abolished uh, banning against the production and selling. 
uh, that means uh, the possession and personality with some impose of uh, regulation and taxation by the by the government. So uh, there is a quite a huge difference. As you can see uh, in this uh, uh, diagram, uh, this uh, what we call a conceptual framework with regards to uh, uh, drug policy spectrum. As you can see here, the decriminalizations. And, and if you, if you pro prohibit, eh, you prohibit uh, uh, completely uh, the drug, you can see there is a rising unregulated criminal market. And if you uh, uh, totally legalize or un unsolicited access, there is also unregulated legal market. So uh, decriminalization actually stand here. As you can see, uh, for both decriminalization and harm reduction, it reduces the unregulated criminal market to at a very minimum level. And of course, the ideal is to have this responsible legal, legal regulation. I suppose this is what we do for uh, smoking and also alcohol use in Malaysia. Yeah? And this uh, uh, model uh, is, uh, can be used for different drugs, but different uh, degrees of regulation. Maybe for cannabis, we, we probably uh, put it here, decreasing harm reductions, but of course for um, uh, other substance, for example, like tobacco smoking, we have this uh, responsible legal reg regulation. So, so what are the rationals and benefits of decriminalization? So we want to reduce the stigma and we want to expand the access for treatment. This is number one. Uh, when we uh, uh, decriminalize drug users, more and more uh, of them can, can come forward and seek treatment. And of course, when they seek treatment, we can address their the health issue, the uh, comorbid uh, psychiatric problems, the infectious disease and so on. And we also can reduce the number of inmates in the prisons. Uh, you know, I, I just want to give examples uh, uh, in, in Netherlands. Netherlands, they, they actually practice this uh, um, decriminalization of, of drug use. And what we, uh, they, they actually achieve, they are able to actually uh, reduce number of inmates in their prison to the extent that they, they import the, the inmate from other country, you know, uh, and they can make money from their prisons. I think we should, should be able to do like that as well. If we uh, practice decriminalization. As I mentioned just now, 60% of them are drug related crime. And if we, if we practice decriminalization, we can reduce 60% uh, uh, of the number of the inmates in the prison. And we want to pre prevent the spread of the infectious disease, uh, especially in the crowded prisons. Uh, we want to save ta taxpayers money as well. We want to allocate money for better treatment. Yeah? And, and, and we, we know that many countries have already been impl implement this decriminalization, for example, like Portugal, among the lowest rate of drug use uh, after they implement uh, in the European country, followed by Netherlands. Uh, Sweden uh, and, and so on. So the impl implementation and challenges, are we ready? I, th I think you have to ask these questions, are we ready? So in Malaysia, uh, we have a joint statement between the current Prime Ministers, uh, Tan Sri Mohyiddin and our previous administrators last time, uh, Datuk uh, Suzuki um, uh, on this decriminalization on drug use and to go forward. And even for the current uh, um, health ministers, I think both are, of them are doctors. And we know, for example, like um, uh, Dr. Azmi, uh, the YB, YB Dr. Azmi from, from, from Bagan Serai, he also very, uh, very much uh, our supporters in this uh, decriminalization of drug use. Uh, there is a growing support also for other MPs and also NGO, for example, like uh, YB Nuru Iza. Uh, and NGO like uh, Pengasih, Sinakasih, uh, dan sebagainya. Uh, however, uh, there is some resistance from the public, uh, and mainly due to the lack of uh, awareness. I think uh, there is a lot of uh, awareness program must be carried out, especially among the public. And I believe there is a need for the proposal of pilot project on decriminalization for the time being. So this is the time. And uh, MOH or Ministry of Health, uh, as main, main stakeholder, uh, need to set up the committees uh, with relevant agencies, including NGOs, uh, to take part in this uh, pilot project. So, in conclusion, it's timely for Malaysia to start decriminalization for drug use in view of the evidence of success story by other countries. 
and also uh, at this current moment, we, our country, need to save money in the in the era of the financial crisis. I believe Malaysia are ready in view of the strong backup from the existing harm reduction program. Uh, there is uh, the, the medication step treatment program like methadone, food zone, and also we also see uh, quite good support from the NGOs uh, uh, outside there. However, the implementation should be careful on and should be monitored closely to ensure the success uh, and also the, to prevent the backfire from the public. So with that, uh, I just wanted to end my, my presentation with a newspaper cutting from our uh, ex-minister uh, last time. Malaysia to decriminalize drug use. So as you can see, thank you. Uh, I welcome any questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, Rosdi. That is a uh, very insightful uh, presentation. Um, however, I think right, uh, why we get like, resistance from the public is uh, the public are just very confused, lack of awareness. Um, and one thing is right, uh, they really do not know what is the difference between decriminalization and uh, legalization. Uh, I know just now you have mentioned about uh, that, right, uh, the differences. Could you actually um, well, currently there's a lot of confusions about the cannabis use. Uh, there are parties that uh, support legalization. There are parties that uh, support decriminalization. Uh, so um, let's say, right, uh, could you uh, explain, like, uh, let's say, right, uh, i give you a scenario that if a person uh, is using the cannabis, what will he like the fate, right? Uh, if it's under the decriminalization model uh, compared to if he is under the legalization model? Uh, thank you for, for the question. I think this is a very important question. Uh, you know, uh, we, we know that not even uh, the, on, among the public, even among the professional, we are still confused the difference between decriminalization and legalization. Legalization, legalization is uh, something like 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 uh, smoking, you know, tobacco smoking, alcohol, where the government actually, uh, to some extent, allow uh, selling possessions, but uh, of course, uh, they take uh, uh, tax uh, from from all these uh, people. And um, with regards to cannabis, um, uh, for my opinion, you know, as a psychiatrist practicing uh, in UMMC, I I see a lot of uh, patients. Who, when they use uh, cannabis, particularly the THC or tetrahydrocannabinol, they go into uh, psychosis as well as uh, uh, you know, our schizophrenic patients, they have multiple relapse, especially when they use this cannabis. So uh, um, for cannabis, uh, we also know that there is uh, another uh, component, what we call cannabidiol or CBD, which is quite good and potential to be used as a anti psychotic and also uh, uh, that to, is the one that called yeah, the medicinal yeah. uh, cannabis, medicinal cannabis yeah. or CBD, which mm. is good also uh, and, and potential to, to be used uh, as a uh, treatment for TSC dependence. So I believe uh, the best model for, for, for cannabis should be the decriminalization, you know, uh, and where the government uh, uh, allow the use for medical purposes. Uh, of course, selling say, selling uh, of this uh, TSC, I, I disagree. Mm -hmm. uh, complete legalization, but, but for CBD, yes. So that that is why when we uh, wanted to to apply this this uh, policy yeah, uh, for certain substance, I think we have to look into uh, different different substances. You mm -hmm. know, uh, for example, for um, it, it, it cannot apply. Uh, to every substance, you, you need to choose substance that can be used for decriminalization and substance that can be used for complete legalization. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so let's say right, uh, persons that uh, mm -hmm. have a possessions of the cannabis, mm -hmm. um, small amount, um, mm -hmm. uh, just for his own juice, under the decriminalization side, right, uh, what will he, uh, what will his future, I mean, like uh, becomes? That's why if he just uh, you know possess small amount or 
or maybe uh, just urine positive. So this is the, the type of people we 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 should actually protect from going into uh, judicial system. And instead of going to judicial judicial system or criminal justice system, these patients should be uh, channeled into what we call uh, uh, administrative order. You know, they have to go to the um, uh, treatment. For example, uh, if it depends on the severity. We need to set up the, the board that can actually assess uh, the severity of the uh, substance use. In the case of cannabis, eh, if they just, uh, you know, use uh, at, for the recreational uh, uh, basis, maybe we should give more advice uh, for, for the first time, uh, for positive, uh, maybe uh, advice is enough. Uh, and education, but for the second time, maybe uh, we can uh, impose the penalty. Yeah, the penalty like uh, hima masyarakat, for example, and for those who are actually uh, quite severe and become uh, highly addicted, and it's already uh, have a, a problem uh, in terms of uh, functioning, uh, drug induced psychosis or cannabis induced psychosis. This is the group that you you should prefer for proper treatment uh, in the health uh, setting. Uh, in order to help them uh, going back to society. Right. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, that will uh, be the end of our presentations. Uh, and thanks, right, uh, you all with us, right, uh, this morning, uh, breakfast at uh, FOM. And next week, um, the breakfast at FOM uh, will be with uh, departments of uh, surgery. Thank you.